Hello and good evening, everyone. So excited you all could join us for this high yield EKGs for the USMLE and complex webinar. Uh, my name is Moses Murdoch. I am an intern as well as a step one tutor with MST for a number of years now. And it is my absolute pleasure to be here with all star Dr. Joe Hansen. Uh, Joe, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. My name is uh, Dr. Joe Hansen. I've been working with med school tutors for over four years. And in that time frame, I've tutored about 300 individual students towards their USMLE Step 1, Step 2, Comlex Level 1, Level 2 exams. I spent over 6,000 hours on camera like this working with students towards all the medical material from basic biochem up through the clinical exams. So hopefully I can shed some of that experience to you guys tonight. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to very briefly uh, just mention that, as we've both said, we work for med school tutors. We'll have more information about this at the end, but this is just a taste of what we do with students one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes in groups along the educational spectrum. So Joe, kick us off. Sure. All right. So tonight's focus is going to be on reading EKGs. So we'll go through the basic steps, how we're going to get through these EKGs, what you're going to look for when you initially see one. Uh, hopefully you won't see too many 12 lead EKGs on like the step one or level one exam, but just in case it happens, you'll be prepared from top to bottom on how to read these. We'll then move on to commonly tested examples of what you'll see for rhythm strips and arrhythmias. Uh, then we'll start going into more of like a question answer format where we'll be asking you guys to provide some feedback as we run through some samples together. Uh, and then towards the end, as we have time to do so, we'll answer any questions you guys about uh, you guys have about EKG reading or anything regarding uh, med school tutors or tutoring in general. Um, that's our plan. So we should probably dive into it because we got a lot to talk about tonight. Absolutely. Cool. All right. So I'll start us off with the basics for EKG reading. As soon as you guys open up an EKG, the very first five steps you're always going to be considering are rate rhythm, axis, intervals, and morphology. I know it's not super catchy, but we're gonna to try to drill into your head as much as possible. Uh, so we'll want to run through each of these one by one and what we would look for in EKGs in order to do these, and then we'll apply them to some examples tonight. So let's go ahead and dive into how we would read the rate on one of these things. So we got our first 12 lead EKG, and you'll notice as advertised, there are 12 leads towards the top of this thing, which is one AVR, V1, V4, in that order horizontally across here. It's kind of a mess when you first look at it. You'll notice though, that if you scan down to the bottom half of the image, we have three rhythm strips. In these rhythm strips, we have 10 seconds of duration of an EKG that we're looking at. The purpose here is to scan across these 10 seconds to see what the heart rate is, and generally what the rhythm is, like how frequently the, the QRS complexes show up and what relation they have to one another. The very first thing that we're gonna do here when we're looking for the rate is to scan down to those rhythm strips. And the general rule of thumb is that we're gonna look at two QRS complexes and count the number of big boxes between them. The big idea here is that by math, somehow, if you divide the number 300 by the number of big boxes that you have between the QRS complexes, that will give you your rate. So for instance, if you have three big boxes in between the QRS complexes and you have 300 divided by three, that gives you a rate of 100 beats per minute. Now, technically, if there was one big box between these guys, you'd have a rate of 300. Very difficult to accomplish, not clinically possible in many cases. So generally speaking, we're expecting a heart rate of somewhere between like 50 and 150. So somewhere around the span of two boxes to five boxes or so. Now, that being said, that's the easy rule. That's the shortcut rule. 300 divided by number of big boxes. Sometimes that doesn't work out so well. As you might imagine, there might be different spaces between the QRS complexes, namely in somebody who, say, has an arrhythmia, which is one of the main reasons we're looking in EKG is to determine whether they have one of those. If that were to happen, we can't rely on this rule anymore because, as you can see on this bottom rhythm strip where Moses has our pointer, there are some R to R intervals between QRS complexes that have somewhere around four boxes or three boxes or four again, or three or four and a half. Well, which one do we choose? Like how do we decide what our heart rate is? And the thing here is we can't really, we, because it varies and sometimes it varies irregularly, we can't really establish a pattern here. So to determine our rate right off the bat, the other shortcut we can take is to realize that this is a 10 second rhythm strip. So if I simply count out the number of beats over 10 seconds, if I multiply that number by six, I now have the number of beats in 60 seconds. So we have two strategies now when looking at a full 12 lead EKG for determining our rate. The kind of harder way, which is actually counting the beats one by one and multiplying by six, or 
the simpler but more memorization heavy way, which is dividing the number 300 by the number of big boxes. Anything I failed to mention there, Moses? That was beautifully done. Nothing to add. Thanks, which man. brings us really nicely to talking about the rhythm. And that's something that Joe was mentioning just now. Um, when first step is to look at the rate, then you're looking at the rhythm. And often there's language that goes into talking about the rhythm. Is it regular? Is it irregular? Is it regularly irregular or irregularly irregular? It can be sort of hard to keep track of what we mean by that. So I'm gonna share with you a couple of things you can look at to figure out the rhythm of a particular strip or a particular EKG. So the first thing that we're looking for, and let's take a step back into cardiac physiology. In a normal heart rate, you know, you have the impulse starting in the sinoatrial node. It's traveling through the atria. It's paused for a little bit of time as it traverses the AV node. It goes down those um, bundles of Hiss and the Purkinje system depolarizing the ventricles, right? And so we expect a particular direction and order to these events happening if the underlying uh, heart is normal and it's functioning properly. So what we expect to see is a P uh, wave, and it's uh, several of these are highlighted here with the red arrows. We expect a P wave before every QRS. In other words, we're expecting atrial activity that is propagating through the heart and then followed by ventricular activity. But of course, we know that sometimes uh, signals and impulses from the atria aren't coming from where we expect them. They aren't coming from the SA node and then traveling through the atria to the AV node. Sometimes they're popping in from all over the place. And we'll talk a little bit later about some diseases in which that is very characteristic, or sometimes it's just an ectopic fo focus of activity. So one clue to look at is the P wave and lead to, and we'll get into, a lot of this is interrelated, but we'll get into later why two and some of these other leads are particularly informative, but we expect an upright P wave in two. Sometimes we look for a biphasic in V1, but really two is where I spend a lot of my effort. So again, there was a lot of words, but P before every QRS, QRS after every P, and we expect it to be upright in two, right? And then we expect the depolarization to be followed by repolarization of the ventricles. And so we expect to see T waves after every QRS. Now in general, sometimes you can just eyeball the regularity. Um, a clue, as we saw in the last EKG, is if the distance between two QRS complexes is not constant across the resonance strip, that's a clue that you're dealing with an irregular rhythm. If there's some structure, some underlying pattern to the way in which it's not equal between each QRS across your strip, well, we call that regularly irregular. If there's no pattern at all underneath, and there are diseases we'll talk about later where that's the case, that would be more of an irregularly irregular situation. This will become far more clear as we get into specific examples. And I also wanna take this opportunity to say that we can see what you are putting into the chat. Often, you know, different participants, participants can't see what other participants are typing, but we see everything. We'll respond to your questions as much as we can uh, during the webinar and there'll be opportunities um, to uh, chat and have your questions answered at the end. All right. So if I haven't completely confused everyone with uh, rhythm, we'll redeem ourselves with axis. Joe, take it away. Sure, absolutely. So as Moses was suggesting here, the direction of electricity moving through the heart is really important. We would normally anticipate that electricity would be going from the top right of the heart where we have the SA node down towards the bottom left towards the cardiac apex. That would be our normal axis towards where electricity is going. Now, one really nice thing that we can do with the EKG is we can look at whether the QRS complexes point upwards or point downwards. Generally speaking, electricity pointing towards a lead is going to have an upward deflection and electricity that's moving away from a lead is going to have a downward or negative deflection. Now this is really beneficial once we realize that each individual lead on the 12 lead EKG represents a cardinal direction. Lead one that we can see on this diagram is pointing straight to the patient's left whereas leads two, three, and AVF are pointing some degree of downwards. So we can anticipate then that if I see that we have a large positive deflection in AVF, electricity is probably going more downwards than it is upwards. I would anticipate then that if electricity is pointing straight at AVF, I probably have a negative deflection in AVR and or AVL since those guys are kind of pointing upwards. By looking at 
which leads are upright and which, which leads are pointing downwards, we can then kind of determine where the electricity is actually going. To simplify this, and you really don't need to go into too much detail on axis when it comes to like step and level exams in general, usually we have electricity pointing down and to the left, and that's towards the space in between lead one, which points left, and lead ABF, which points down. The normal axis, as we can see on this diagram, is pointing down in that down left direction that we have here. Now, there are circumstances where electricity can start going in weird directions. The electricity doesn't just go down to the cardiac apex, it then goes up through the free walls of the ventricles. You can imagine then somebody who has like left-sided heart strain or a super thick left ventricular wall would see a lot of electricity making that corner and going up towards the patient's upward left area as it goes through the free wall of the left ventricle. That means that the axis of the heart overall kind of bends instead of going down into the left and starts going kind of up into the left. That would be called left axis deviation and would be evidence of a heart that's working really, really hard on the left side or really thickened on the left side. Alternatively, somebody who has right heart strain or right axis deviation would have electricity that's pointing down towards lead three on this diagram, which means we'd probably be pointing away from lead one in that case, which would mean make lead one negative if we had axis deviation. In short, you should see that lead one and ABF both point upwards. If they don't, now you're in axis deviation territory and you probably have to determine which direction the axis has shifted, which might be based on clinical symptoms or based on which leads here have negative deflections. Did I miss anything there in terms of the basic reading there, Moses? No, that's wonderful. And it actually answers a question that I, uh, the point that I was making in the prior point about rhythm notice the direction two is pointing in. It's really beautifully within this green normal axis. So I expect if the activity is starting up here in the SA node and then moving down to the AV node, that arrow is pointing pretty much exactly down two. And that's why we expect two to be positive. For the P wave, um, you mean specifically? Yes, yes, for the P wave, exactly. Yeah. So atrial depolarization definitely points in that direction. On that note, really quickly, uh, there's a PIM yeah. question that I'm always asked, like whenever I'm clinical wards, which is uh, what sinus rhythm is. Mm -hmm. uh, in general, uh, just talking about that rhythm a little bit and the P wave in particular, if you're ever asked that question by an attending, what is sinus rhythm? It means P wave before every QRS and QRS after every P wave. I know it sounds like I'm repeating myself, but you need to say both when you're asked this question because you could have a P wave with nothing after it. That's a P wave without a QRS. And you could have a QRS with no P wave before it. That's a QRS without a P wave. So you have to be paired one-to-one -one between those two things in order to confidently state that the SA node is totally in control of the ventricles. If that ever doesn't happen, now we're into arrhythmia territory. But if we have a P wave before every QRS and a QRS after every P wave, we can say pretty confidently that we have a sinus rhythm in that case, outside of a couple of other weird conditions that could happen. Absolutely. Very well said. The other point being that you need to have that P wave, um, as best as you can tell, represent SA to AV node conduction. Um, as opposed to an ectopic focus. All of this, we're giving you uh, extra money's worth because a lot of this <laughs> is unlikely to be directly tested on these exams, but it's good because if you have this solid foundation, everything else flows really naturally from it. Um, next, we talk about intervals and the intervals refer to the evidence on the EKG of the electrical activity of the heart as it happens in sequence. So we talked about atrial depolarization, followed by ventricular depolarization. And notice that atrial repolarization is hidden, right? Because the ventricles have so much activity going on, the atria, as they recover, um, you can't see that electrographically on, on your chart, um, followed by ventricular repolarization. And the intervals that we really care about are the PR interval. So the interval between the start of the P wave, the start of QRS, the QRS width, right? Like how thick is the entire, or how long does it take rather, um, for the, uh, the ventricles to depolarize? And then the QT interval, which is the interval um, between the start of the, um, the ventricular depolarization and the end of ventricular repolarization, the end of that T wave. And so throughout, we'll be throwing out questions to you. Take a look at this EKG do any of the intervals 
uh, look abnormal to you all. And I'll give you all 10 seconds to, to take a look and put your, your guesses in the chart. Thank you so much for those who are brave enough to put your thoughts out there. We won't call you out by name. Amazing, I'm already seeing some of the correct answers in the chat. And what we're looking at is a long QT, right? Um, one of the tricks that you learn on the wards is you take the distance between two QRS intervals. A normal QRS should be about halfway between them. And notice that as I'm moving my mouse, roughly halfway is smack dab in the middle of a T wave. So the end of that T wave is beyond that halfway point. The computers are generally pretty good at calculating QTs. There are some exceptions, there's fancy formulas. I won't go into any of that, but that's a quick tip for how to um, guesstimate what your QT will look like. Awesome. And let's make sure to ask students uh, what they think we're at higher risk for if we have a long QT, what arrhythmia might develop from this. Excellent question. All right, lots of good answers coming in here. And I apologize in advance, guys, if you see me gazing off to the side here where I have my secondary monitor where your answers are popping up. It's not because I'm ignoring you, I'm actually paying attention to you. You might see me responding to some questions by typing as well. So I apologize if I look a little bit distracted. Great answers from tons of people. Torsad is the best answer they're looking for here, which is also a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. So very characteristic and specific appearance that's gonna show up on pretty much any step or level exam. So long QT and torsades go together really nicely. Absolutely. And, and bonus points to anyone in the chat who can put in what medication you would give if you saw torsades. Ooh. All right. Extra, extra bonus points. I'm seeing a lot of magnesium in the chart, uh, in the chat, exactly. Awesome. All right, so let's move on to our last uh, of the five major categories here. Uh, so we've gone through rate, rhythm, axis intervals, and now on to morphology. So for morphology, it's kind of the grab bag here. So this is the miscellaneous, look all over the place and see what you can find. There's a bunch of strange things that you'll become more accustomed to seeing as you see more and more EKGs. We'll see these kind of uh, P waves that have different morphologies and multifocal atrial tachycardia. You'll see peaked T waves from time to time where the T wave gets this really sharp and tall shape to it. You'll see like wide QRSs where the QRS complex is wider than it should be. You'll see kind of like weird bunny ear shapes to the QRS complexes. If you're looking for something like a bundle branch block, it's a lot of stuff. And so there's not one key coherent way that you can look at morphology here. But the one thing that I would really strongly encourage that you guys pay attention to when we're looking at morphology is the ST segment. If nothing else, try to glance at the ST segment in several different leads to see if there's anything going on there that shouldn't be going on. In particular, I see some people already starting to provide some answers, but can anybody tell me what's going on in this EKG that has an abnormal morphology? Awesome, all right. So several people saying ST segment elevation already. So thank you so much, guys. And in particular here, these ST segment ele uh, elevations are organized into a particular territory. Can anybody tell me what the diagnosis most likely is just based on the ST segment lo uh, locations? All right, lots of good answers saying myocardial infarction and a lot of answers saying inferior myocardial infarction, and that's the most correct answer. A couple of people saying anterior, other things like that. In particular, leads 2, 3, and ABF. Remember we said before from the axis discussion, those guys are pointing downwards. And so if you see that we have ST segment elevations in 2, 3, and ABF, as we do in this image, that means that the inferior surface or bottom surface of the heart is the part that has the electrical abnormality, which indicates that's the area that's experiencing the ischemia. When you see this baseline elevation, the space in between the QRS complex and the T wave doesn't make it all the way down to the baseline. Instead, it's elevated. That's an ST elevation. And ST elevation are the first parts of the acronym STEMI, which is really bad, really severe diagnosis when we have an ST elevation myocardial infarction. So excellent job reading through that, guys. Uh, basic idea here is look for ST elevations, look for T wave changes. That's the most basic thing that we can do in the context of morphology. There are other things that you'll pick up into your grab bag of individual facts about uh, the EKG, 
but generally speaking, you're gonna hit pay dirt more frequently than not if you look for the ST segment, if there is any morphological change on any kind of step or level exam question. Awesome. So as everyone indicated, inferior MI, territorial SD changes, very concerning for a transmural infarction, as was mentioned in the chat. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. An excellent question by one of the people in the chat that I'll try to answer directly here. Uh, which artery in particular, usually the right coronary artery, so good answer, is the one that's going to be responsible for an inferior myocardial infarction. Generally speaking, another good answer popping in here, but it's because the right coronary artery gives off the posterior descending artery or the PDA. So extra bonus fact for you guys, I don't wanna confuse you about your exam. So this is really more of a flex for the clinical wards, but the vast majority of people have their inferior surface of their heart supplied by the right coronary artery because it gives off the PDA. But somewhere in the territory of 10 to 20% of people have what's called a left dominant heart where the left circumflex ends up giving off the PDA, in which case the left circumflex is now responsible for the left lateral surface of the heart and the inferior surface of the heart. So in 90% of cases, this would be a right coronary infarction. In a very small subset, it could be a manifestation of a distal left circumflex infarction. On the exam, they will never force you to know that just spontaneously though. So consider for all intents and purposes right now that the right coronary artery is responsible for the inferior surface of the heart. Beautiful. And just as an additional point, again, not that this would come up on exams very much, but sometimes if you're concerned about a right-sided MI or a post posterior MI, you can actually move the leads around to generate extra sort of peaks at the heart. And that can help you diagnose like a right-sided issue, which is actually clinically very meaningful because you don't want to um, lose the preload when the right side of the heart is suffering an infarct. Yeah, um, just to close the loop on that one last little thing, excellent feedback from people chatting to us. So thank you so much for uh, communicating back to us. If we did need to differentiate between like a left-sided, right-sided infarction, if we were thinking that this was the extra hard scenario of a left-sided inferior circulation infarct, we would have the question tell us that a coronary angiography demonstrates left dominant circulation. That's actually in some of the questions for like step two, not so much step one. Or alternatively, uh, they would indicate that there's also ST elevations in the left lateral leads, which would be mm -hmm. like one AVL V6 in that territory, in addition to the inferior leads. For future reference, it's very unlikely somebody's experiencing two heart attacks at once. So if it mm -hmm. looks like there's two territories affected, it's most likely one artery giving off branches to both of those territories. Awesome. And so we're shifting gears a little bit to talk about tachyarrhythmias. And I love schemas. I think having organized approaches to clinical problems, very, very useful. And the way that most people think about tachyarrhythmias is by focusing on the morphology of the QRS. And the big differentiator, is it a narrow complex or a wide complex? And this makes sense because if it's a narrow complex, you know that the ventricles are receiving that impulse in a relatively normal way. Whereas if it's wide, one side may be getting, or both sides may be getting impulses um, that are not originating from the classical sort of AV node down the um, typical bundle pathways. So if the QRS is narrow, then the next branch point is thinking, is it a regular rhythm? And then you would be thinking about something like sinus tachycardia, which don't be reassured by sinus tachycardia. That's the heart responding to something else going on in the body. And you need to really figure out what that something is. Sometimes it's something like a pulmonary embolus. Sometimes it's something like an infection. Again, look for clues in the vignette, fevers, or maybe a clinical history that would suggest a clot. These are common things that show up on, on step examinations and complex examinations. Sometimes it's a supraventricular tachycardia. And the clue there is that there's something funky going on with the P waves. Either there's no P waves or they're coming after the QRS complex. Something funny is going on with the conduction in the atria. It's going too fast. And then it's subsequently conducting down into the ventricles. Or it's a atrial flutter where you have a sort of a circular moving um, pathway of electrical activity very fast around the tricuspid annulus, sending singles that, signals down into the ventricles. The AV node is trying as hard as it can to regulate some of these signals. Occasionally, one of these signals goes through and that's what manifests as atrial flutter. On the other side, if it's a regular rhythm, 
And we sort of uh, preface this or give a preview earlier. It might be something like atrial fibrillation, something fancy, multifocal atrial tachycardia. It could be a flutter, but instead of regular int at regular intervals, signals are passing through, it's sort of a little bit more random. And so it becomes a little bit more irregular. So that's the narrow side of the tachycardia schema. On the right side, we're seeing wide complex. And the same division uh, comes up. Is it regular or is it irregular? And we'll see examples of, the, uh, of each of these sorts of rhythms. There's a question in the chat about a flutter having the sawtooth appearance. Spot on, we'll see a picture of that later on. Um, but you do see that, that sawtooth appearance. Beautiful. And someone else in the chat is pointing out that the rates can sometimes be really informative. Yes, with a flutter, um, you expect something like multiples of 150. So you can see 150, you can see 300. It goes back to what I was saying. How often are those signals from that, that circular path of electricity conducting down into the ventricle? So you all are, are way ahead of me when it comes to that. Um, often wide complex tachycardias are scary because they're uh, things like ventricular tachycardia, which can have rates you know, in the high 100s. Um, one of the tricky things, and it's on this, uh, on this slide, but it's sort of more rarely comes up on the exams, is something with aberrancy. And what all that means is that there's some abnormal rhythm going on. And on top of that, there's um, sort of a malfunctioning conduction pathway such that you end up with a wide QRS, but it's not a ventricular tachycardia or a ventricular fibrillation or something like that as a primary, as a primary process. Anything I missed there, Joe? Uh, no, you nailed it. I do want to point out that uh, as far as the rate of atrial flutter, uh, generally speaking, that 150 to 300 is talking about the atrial rate. But because the AV node is busting as hard as it can to send those signals down to the ventricles, there's no way it's keeping up with that. So if we're discussing the difference in heart rate between like AFib and aflutter, which is a question one of the students asked, that's kind of questionable. It depends on how many beats are actually making it through the AV node. You might have a faster AFib or a faster A-flutter when it comes to ventricular rate, which is what we usually describe the heart rate as being. Meanwhile, the atria could be going to town 300 times per minute and only sending 140 beats per minute down to the ventricles because that's how fast we can get the electricity through the AV node. So just to, to clarify on those two pieces a little bit, but otherwise, uh, awesome. Yeah, big thing here. Wide versus narrow complex, super important. Going back to the morphology conversation that I was pointing out earlier, this is something you'd be looking for in terms of determining like, you know, how wide that QRS complex is because it can really dictate what the pathology is, ha is going on in this patient. I think we're all set though. Awesome. And just to give you all a little bit of practice, we have sort of two clinical scenarios here. In the top, you have a patient who's overdosed on a tricyclic antidepressant. And on the bottom, you see uh, the, just one of the rhythm strips from a patient who is a couple of days out from a myocardial infarction. And it, how about let's start with the top left. What do you all think that is representing? And as, as, you're, as the answers are coming in, I'll just describe it. You see a wide complex, right? You see tachycardia. So it's already putting us on the right side of that graph that we, we just saw. And then you look at how um, uniform it looks. It's um, sort of changing. And a lot of folks are putting torsade, which the whole name of it represents a twisting or it, it alludes to twisting of the points as it comes from, I believe it's French. Awesome. What about the bottom right? And I'm already seeing correct answers. Folks after myocardial infarction, either because of the scar formation or other damage to the myocardium, you're at a higher risk for ventricular tachycardia. And in this case, you notice that it just looks a lot more regular, right? You see wide complex, it's fast, so tachycardia. This is more of a monomorphic picture to the ventricular tachycardia. Beautiful. And I just wanna point out that it is difficult to tell the difference between ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. So remember, both are sort of wide complex tachycardias or they can be wide complex tachycardias. Um, VTAC, at least it's monomorphic form, tends to be more regular. Ventricular fibrillation 
is more of this like jumbled mess where there isn't a clear pattern to it. It's this undulating. You notice how everything sort of looks different. Um, we put these two strips up to just compare and contrast. From a management standpoint, of course, you know, if you have pulseless VTAC or VFib, you're going down the ACLS pathway. Um, and so from that perspective, it's not that different. Of course, if the patient is more stable, then you enter a whole different realm of ventricular tachycardia management. Uh, do you have any, any other tips to tell the difference between the two? I think that one thing that always stood out to me is that if we look at the VTAC appearance, it often has a description as looking like shark teeth and shark teeth mm -hmm. are very sharp, generally speaking, and pretty regular essentially. And so if you imagine looking into Jaws's mouth, you can kind of see that top picture as kind of a shark tooth appearance. One student in the chat had asked, uh, is it uh, likely that VTAC always looks the same or always looks like that? And the answer is kind of. You can tell that there's a difference between this, the appearance of the previous slide and this one slightly, but the overall gist of a monomorphic, wide, complex, big, sharp appearance to the QRS complexes that's usually very fast, so ventricular, wide, complex, tachycardia, fast, uh, is going to be usually what we see there. So there is usually a fairly clear appearance of VTAC, where it almost always looks something like what we have in that top image there. VFib, on the other hand, anybody's guess. Uh, it's all over the place. It's going to be super jumbled, sometimes just a little tiny squiggly line, but very frequently it doesn't have a monomorphic appearance. It is not going to be uniform throughout. You can see that there's variations that are happening all throughout that bottom image there for VFib. You know, one of the ways that I think about this is to sort of correlate it with things that I am more comfortable with in the atria, right? So the way I imagine uh, ventricular fibrillation is if you took that undulating bag of worms baseline in the atria, it sort of looks like a blown up version of that in the ventricles. And just as in the chat, it was mentioned in a flutter, you see the sawtooth, you just, it's using the same sort of mental imagery where you see more of that sawtooth appearance, but in the ventricles. And it sort of alludes to the underlying pathophysiology a little bit, quivering atria, quivering ventricles, you know, in monomorphic VT at least, patterns of aberrant electrical activity whirling around either in the atria around a particular anatomic structure or in the ventricles around a scar or something else that's predisposing to VTAC. And just clarifying to uh, some of the students we have in the chat, yes, the, the lower image is the VFib in this case, and the upper image is the VTAC. Sorry, we didn't explicitly label those while we're talking our way through there. But that's an excellent point, uh, Moses, about the shape of these guys. If we have a reentrant rhythm, if we have electricity, it's like chasing its own tail. We usually have like very clear, sharp lines. VTAC and A flutter are going to be very clear in terms of their up-down motion as all the electricity moves in a synchronous fashion, just way too fast in a circle that we can't control. Whereas if we're looking at VFib or AFib, electricity is basically just kind of randomly going through the ventricle or the atrium, creating a very messy, undulating, uh, uncoordinated baseline there. So you're correct. Absolutely. I, I like that description a lot. The VFib looks like uh, AFib just big and without QRS complexes that are very clear. Exactly. Love it. Cool. All right, let's move on to some examples here. So finally, a 12 lead EKG that we can all look at together. I'm going to start walking through our rate, rhythm, axis, intervals, morphology plan and see where we start to run into problems. The very first problem you might notice here is that unlike a lot of the 12 lead EKGs that you'll see, we have our 12 leads, but there is no rhythm strip at the bottom. So immediately that poses a problem for us in determining what the rhythm looks like, because now I'm not gonna be as able to calculate my heart rate. I could really stretch myself to try to figure that out, but it's gonna be more difficult now. We still have 10 seconds spreading from lead two to V5. I'm looking at several different places at once and as a result, it's not as reliable as having a full 10 second rhythm strip. So all we can really do is just kind of scan these individual leads now and look for more like the intervals and morphology and maybe the axis if we need to. So everybody looking at this right now, start telling me, what do you see that seems very obvious in a couple of these leads? In particular, I'll point out two AVL, three AVF are really giving me a solid picture of this. What does that look like? All right, I've got two prominent things. Oh, good point. Somebody's saying, I don't see P waves. <laughs> yeah, that's right, because these aren't normal P waves that we're looking at. A lot of other students are saying, this is a sawtooth pattern that I'm seeing. In particular, that usually means that I'm looking at a flutter. Like we were saying before, a flutter is a signal that's circling around, usually the tricuspid annulus, going super duper fast, 
shooting electrical activity out to the rest of the atrium. I like to think of like imagining one of those firework pinwheels that you put on the side of a tree and it just spins and shoots sparks everywhere. That's basically a flutter. And as a result, we're seeing the rest of the atrium is just depolarizing super duper fast. In particular, it looks like I have three little shark fins for every QRS complex, in which case we would say that this is a four to one block. I said four to one, but not three to one. And the reason for that is because I know that the atrial flutter that we're seeing here is very regular, which means that there must be another atrial depolarization behind the QRS complex. I know it's there, I just can't see it because the QRS complex is stronger and bigger, higher amplitude on the image, which means for every one QRS, there are four different atrial depolarizations happening at once. So to the students who are saying, well, there's no P waves here, technically there are just really big shark fin shaped P waves and lots and lots of them. Great job, everybody. Beautiful. And uh, someone's pointing out that uh, the question is whether there's a right bundle branch block in, in V3. And I think what you're referring to there is sort of the M, right, that you look for. Um, it's sort of hard to tell here. It looks like there's something going on uh, in those in, with that particular bead, like that first bead in V3, because you have the inverted T wave, whether that's a junctional rhythm of some sort. We'll have examples of some of this stuff further on as well. Um, but typically you look at like V1 um, uh, for like the left bundle, branch, left bundle branch blocks as well as the right bundle branch block. Before we uh, jump ahead here, I'll just clarify a couple of things with some of the students that are asking questions here. So excellent questions, by the way. Thank you. Keep those coming. Um, first, how to differentiate between a flutter and VTAC? Because we said they're very similar. We'll notice that there actually is a very clear QRS complex happening from time to time on the CKG. The issue that we have in VTAC is we have only QRS complexes continuously throughout. Here we have several atrial depolarizations followed by one QRS depolarization. That means that while there is an atrial arrhythmia going on, there still are normal QRS complexes happening every once in a while and in a regular fashion in this case. So this cannot be VTAC because I still see normal narrow complex QRS complexes that are happening from time to time. Um, another question is, does a flutter have to be tachycardia? And the answer is, Almost certainly yes, because basically what we're saying is that we are bombarding the AV node with like 150 beats per minute or 300 beats per minute. And so the AV node is going to let through like half of those or like, you know, some of those at least. In this case, we're doing a four to one block. So like, you know, it looks like this person probably has a fairly normal ventricular beat. But in many cases, you're going to find that you have a really fast response from the ventricles. Here, it just so happens the AV node is slow enough that it's not letting a lot of the beats in. It's kind of just only lining up every fourth beat. This is a really silly example, but what we're seeing in this particular case is it's like you have two blinkers at like a left turn light, for instance, and like every fourth blink, they blink together, kind of, if that makes any sense in terms of the oscillating pattern of the atrial flutter only causing ventricular depolarization when the ventricles are ready to receive it. So in short, it's not necessary to have ventricular tachycardia. That is to say, it's not necessarily to have a fast heart rate in a flutter, but it very commonly will be the case. And typically fast heart rates with these atrial arrhythmias is not a good thing. In the hospital, you will commonly see atrial flutter that's going too fast. Atrial fibrillation has its, whole, its own name for when this happens. It's called rapid ventricular response. And often it can be a medical emergency because folks, the heart is not able to generate enough forward flow and they, they feel crummy and we have to treat that. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, sorry to jump in. Just one more thing, reiterating. It looks like this is a three to one heart block because I see three P waves, but there is a fourth P wave definitely there behind the QRS complex. I know there's another one there because I see how regular the P waves are. It's just too small to be seen because the QRS complex amplitude is much larger and overshadows the appearance of that other P wave. So to jump in there, Moses, uh, but I wanted to make No, that thank you so much for clarifying. Sight. <laughs> so I, I think I'm set on this one. Any more to say on your end? No, no, I think that's great. And again, just to point point out, because someone is asking me to do that. So uh, sawtooth one, sawtooth two, sawtooth three, QRS. And there's another sawtooth behind this QRS that the ventricle is hiding. So four, and then there's one QRS. Awesome. All right. We have another practice strip.
And uh, I can't promise that all the EKGs you'll see will have helpful large red arrows pointing to them, but we will be disciplined by uh, looking at the rate, right? And so if you're looking here, one, two, three, four, between four and five boxes, so not tachycardic at this point, we're looking at the rhythm, we're seeing P waves, right? Before the QRSs, so that's good. Um, looking at the intervals, and this is where sometimes things get a little interesting, right? Because there's a little ditzel. There's a deflection. It's not a smooth uprise to the QRS. And I can't keep, I can't keep this a secret from you all. Uh, lots of folks are already pointing out that, and as, as shown here, but really nicely actually in V6, the slope changes. The slope changes. And that's pathognomonic for wolf parkinson White syndrome. And because you all are just experts already, um, how do you all feel if I uh, give a beta blocker to this patient? Is that a good idea? What do you all think? Oh my goodness, I'm seeing no with like four O's. Excellent, <laughs> excellent. And that's because you don't wanna give AV nodal blocking agents when you have something like a bundle of Kent involved, right? It might actually make things worse. Um, and someone's already putting in the chat what you could consider instead procainamide. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Again, when you have that bundle of Kent, if you slow down the conduction through the AV node, because that's what beta blockers and calcium channel blockers and, and other uh, medications do, you can actually precipitate signals coming back through the bundle of Kent and kick off this reentrant cycle and actually make the arrhythmia worse. So that's why generally you don't want to do that. Anything to add? Uh, I'll simply throw in there that the general rule of thumb, as you guys are selecting what medications to use for step two and level two, not so much for step one and level one, where prescriptive indications for what to do with arrhythmias is pretty rare. Usually they're asking for mechanics, like how does this antiarrhythmic work? But in the future, or for those of you who are working on step two, level two right now, generally speaking, you will be very safe in choosing to use some kind of nodal blocking agent for any narrow complex arrhythmia. That means using beta blockers class two or calcium channel blockers class four. That is the general rule of thumb without any other contraindications to using those medications that you would use for some kind of supraventricular or narrow complex tachycardia. Meanwhile, to correct or prevent a wide complex or ventricular arrhythmia, you would typically be using class one or class three antiarrhythmics. You will probably answer 90% of the antiarrhythmic questions correctly if you simply stick with that rule because they will usually only give you one viable medication to use on the exam. So for instance, you may have three beta blocker calcium channel blocker like class mm -hmm. two, class four medications and a single class one medication to use while well, you go with the single class one medication if we're looking at a ventricular arrhythmia. Wolf Parkinson White syndrome is so commonly tested because it's fairly common in the real world as things go, but also because it breaks the rule. There's a general rule, which is using class two and class four for narrow complex arrhythmias and using class one and class three for wide complex. But if you do that in Wolf Parkinson White, you kill your patient potentially which means that we have to know the exception to the rule exceptionally well, which is why we end up using a class one medication like procainamide and Wolf Parkinson White, even though it breaks our typical rule for antiarrhythmic use. So for those of you who are moving on to clinical work here, this is the one exception to that rule. Try not to let it dissuade you from using beta blockers or calcium channel blockers for other narrow complex arrhythmias that you'll be seeing. Yep, exactly right. Cool. All right, let's move on then from tachyarrhythmias to bradyarrhythmias, so slow heart rates. One of the major rules that we're going to run across for step one and step two is that bradyarrhythmias basically amount to AV nodal problems. The AV node is the gatekeeper for the ventricles. In order to send a signal from the atria down to the ventricles, I need to go through the AV node. Know, unless they have a bundle of Kent or something like that. So for the most part, usually the AV node is the one way down, which means if the AV node is injured or damaged or hurt in any way, we may start to see that it's harder and harder to propagate P waves into QRS complexes. And eventually if things get really bad, we have P waves followed by nothing. And then QRS complexes only show up every couple of P waves. What I've described here is the pathway from first degree AV nodal block where depolarization of the atria, P waves, happens 
a, and then there's a little bit longer spread before we have a QRS complex. That spread, the PR interval, is the time it takes for the atrial depolarization to propagate through the AV node. The AV node is purposefully very slow. It has very slow conduction and is the slowest conducting tissue in the entire pathway for the electrical system of the heart in order to allow ventricular filling to occur during atrial depolarization before the ventricles fire. So we want like a little bit of a gap between atrial contraction and ventricular contraction so that the ventricles can fill fully. But if the AV node is injured at all, it's already going pretty slow. So if it keeps going slower, that's where we can start having problems. Now, first degree AV node block, boring. The PR interval gets a little bit longer than it should be. Usually 0.2 seconds or one big box is the amount of time that we're expecting to see between the start of the P wave and the start of the QRS. Not really anything important about that. You just have to kind of know it. First degree AV node block is going to be a slow PR interval. Second degree AV node block in general, whether it's MOBITS 1 or MOBITS 2, you start dropping beats. You have a P wave, and then sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes that P wave does not get answered by the ventricles. You have a P wave followed by blank space every once in a while. Now, that can either come in the form of a pattern where the PR interval gradually prolongs with every beat until finally we drop one, or it can be totally random where the P waves just sometimes don't make it all the way through. It being random is more dangerous because we can't really see it coming. And that's why we call that second degree type two, which is the worser type of second degree. And the reason we consider it to be the worser type is because that's the one that naturally develops into third degree heart block, the final phase where the AV node is now dead. It doesn't do anything. The P waves are doing whatever they want to do. And the ventricles are now firing totally on their own. They are off the leash. They can do whatever they want. And usually the ventricles want to beat a little bit more slowly than other tissues, and so they're going to go a little bit slower, hence bradyarrhythmia. We're missing ventricular beats or we're going slower than normal, and so we have a slow arrhythmia, hence bradyarrhythmia. Anything to add to that uh, in general, Moses? No, that was beautifully said. The key is that in first degree, you maintain that rule about P before every QRS, QRS after every P. The rest, things start breaking down a little bit, right? Absolutely. I'll simply add in too, this is a little bit more clinical, but we do need to use a pacemaker if the ventricles aren't responding to the atria. Mm -hmm. And so for third degree, we use a pacemaker. I don't need to use a pacemaker in second degree type two necessarily for itself. But remember I said, it turns into third degree pretty much randomly. So we should just put a pacemaker and then just in case they develop third degree AV nodal block uh, after they leave your clinic, which they inevitably probably will. Exactly. All right. So with that in mind, what I just talked about, we're going to go ahead and do our normal 12 lead EKG evaluation of this particular 12 lead EKG. And starting off, rate is the first thing. And as I calculate my rate, if I try to use my big box theory, things get out of hand very quickly. We're going all the way down to the rhythm strip at the bottom. Lead V1 is re-represented at the bottom. And I can see that I have um, nine big boxes in between the QRS complexes. Uh, and I can't really do math that well, but that seems to be like maybe a heart rate of somewhere between like 30 and 40 that we're seeing in that case, ballparking it. That's pretty slow. And then I can just simply count the number of beats, right? I could see that I have one, two, three, four, five, between five and six beats in my 10 second EKG, which means that I have somewhere around like maybe a heart rate of 30 to 36 on there, give or take. So uh, pretty, pretty slow in terms of how things are going there. That leads me to ask about the rhythm. And remember, a sinus rhythm is when you have a P wave for every QRS complex. So I don't necessarily see that I have a QRS following every P wave on here. I know the P waves are very small in this image, but you can see them there. So what's my diagnosis in this? I'm already seeing a couple of people guessing what the uh, diagnosis is. Very good, all right, getting some answers. A lot of people are saying, I don't really see a P wave before the QRS. And that's a good point because the QRSs are going on their own now because this is third degree. So good job to everybody who answered third degree AV noto block. The P waves are doing their own thing. The QRS complexes are doing their own thing. And every once in a while you might see that they line up, but that's just a coincidence. One key thing I wanna point out here, is this arrhythmia regular or irregular? Go ahead and type that in the chat. All right, nailing it. All right, so most people are saying 
regular. It is regular. And the reason for that is because the space between the QRS, QRS complexes is uniform. It's always the same. It's always like those nine boxes that we're seeing in between them. There's not like very close together QRSs and very far apart. Ironically, a third degree heart block, because the ventricles are just doing their own thing now, and they're not only sometimes getting signals from the atria, they're, they're never getting signals from the atria, they're going to be regular. They're going to follow their own regular rhythm. It's slow, but it's not irregular because we're not sometimes getting beats from the atria and sometimes not. We're just never getting beats anymore, so we're going at our own pace, slow but regular in that case. Awesome. Another practice for you all. Again, we're looking at rate, rhythm, intervals, axis, right? And as we look at this one, I'm looking at the rhythm strip one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, right? So we're right around 60, right around 60. Again, as you look at the looking for P waves. And I like to look in the rhythm strip. I'm seeing one here followed by a QRS. I'm seeing one here followed by QRS. T the QT here is a little bit long, but again, here, QRS, here, QRS. I'm, I'm really confidently seeing a P before every QRS. So if I'm seeing a P before every QRS, then I'm looking at how long does it take between the P and the start of the QRS? And I'm already seeing in the chat the correct answer. If you're seeing a P before every QRS and it's long, you're looking at first degree AV block, sinus bradycardia. Love it. Absolutely. And someone actually pointed out something kind of nice. Um, sometimes if there's just one irregular beat or one beat that's out of place, you could consider it a PVC. Whether that's relevant here is, is perhaps not as important and it's almost never tested, um, but that's something to look out for. If, if there's just one that doesn't fit and it looks morphologically very different, that might be a, a PAC or a PVC as the folks in the chat are, are mentioning. Awesome. One thing to add to that is that a lot of students are identifying that if we look at the rhythm strip, it does appear that the rhythm changes and it does mm -hmm. because so there is, you might say an irregularity happening as we look at like the third and fourth QRS complex in that mm -hmm. rhythm strip, but that's still sinus because there's still a P wave before all those QRS complexes and there's yep. still a QRS complex after every P wave. So that's sinus rhythm. It can be sinus brady, sinus tacky, or just a normal sinus rhythm, but it's always sinus if you have a P wave before the QRS. What we're seeing here is just something changed right there. We happened to catch it with the person mm -hmm. transitioned from a somewhat normal heart rate to a slower heart rate in that case, which is maybe a coincidence, but still technically possible. And for the really fancy among you, um, sometimes the rate actually changes with breathing. You can have something called sinus arrhythmia. Um, I wouldn't worry about this for the exam, but these things exist out there on the wards. You might hear folks talking about them. Awesome. All right, so we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and blast through some very fast rhythm strips here. And the intent here is now to kind of look at like a bunch of examples that you might see on the exam. As some of you might have assessed here, 12 lead EKGs, while possible, are very rarely going to be the focus of many level one and step one questions. And maybe sometimes, but still very occasionally, step two or level two questions. Generally speaking, they give you a single rhythm strip alone, naked of any other context. And you just have to figure out what's going on by looking at the rhythm. So rhythm strips or quick rhythm strips are going to be very common on the exam. Generally speaking, we're going to encourage you should read the context clues, understand what's happening to the patient clinically based on the vignette, and then use the EKG to support the diagnosis that you're making. But in, off, in many cases, you can just read the EKG. And I, I want to clarify one thing before we dive into these there is not only just one rhythm strip on EKGs. It depends on what you order the machine to do. You can have multiple rhythm strips. So you can show multiple different leads for 10 seconds at a time. You'll notice back in the beginning of our presentation, our first EKG had three different rhythm strips on it. 
Uh, it just depends on what you ask the machine to do. In some cases, you might want to pay attention to a particular lead because it looks like it has a clearer morphology for what you're looking for. And so it's just easier to read the EKG. I will point out just as a small thing on like a clinical exam, like medicine shelf or level two or step two, if you do see that you have a 12 lead EKG with multiple rhythm strips, lead two is the rhythm strip. And so if they're giving you multiple rhythm strips, probably pay attention to the other ones that are in the rhythm strip. Like if they give you lead two and V1 for 10 seconds, why did they do that? Lead two is supposed to be the rhythm strip. Probably there's something in V1 that we should pay attention to in that case. It's not universal, but that's probably a hint for us. Um, all right, let's go ahead and dive into them. All right, so again, we're gonna do this rapid fire. We don't know exactly which lead this is, but we're looking first at rate, and eventually you sort of get a, a gestalt for um, for how fast this looks. To me, this looks fast, right? And if you just start counting, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, you know, if it's taking me this long to count how many QRSs there are, I'm in tachycardia land. I'm seeing a P before every QRS and a QRS after every P, right? The baseline sort of changes a little bit. It's drifting downwards here, but I'm seeing that. Um, and then I'm looking at my intervals. So not particularly long uh, for the PR, QRS, generally pretty nice and tight, QT, ending just about at the halfway point. So not particularly um, elongated. And then if I compare the PR interval to the interval after the QRS, right, the QT, um, I'm not seeing elevations or depressions that are particularly noticeable. One other thing, if, uh, if a vignette is going to lead you towards a myocardial infarction, they're probably going to give you more than one lead so that you can identify the territory as we were just talking about in prior examples. Obviously, this isn't always necessary, but for the more complex sorts of questions, that's what you would expect. And so if I'm seeing sinus rhythm, with tachycardia, right? And a P that looks pretty normal morphologically, folks in the chat, sinus tachycardia. Awesome. All right, so let's take a look at this rhythm strip. Again, we can try to assess rate and rhythm here. I'd urge a little bit of caution on the rate analysis for these because I believe that this is a 10 second strip, but I'm not positive until I count all the big boxes, which is painstaking and unnecessary. So I like the idea of attempting to simply use the big box rule here when we're trying to calculate the rate on these things. However, I'm immediately running into a problem here. If I try to count the big boxes, I notice there's three big boxes between the first two beats and then five big boxes and then like two or two and a half or three and then like exactly two. So this is a irregular rhythm and I can't see a pattern here. It's irregularly irregular. It's not like I'm going like five big boxes, two big boxes, five big boxes, two big boxes. I'm going like three, five, two and a half, two all over the place. So if I say irregularly irregular, what are you guys thinking immediately? So go ahead and shout that into the chat box here. All right, pretty much universally nailing it on this one most likely atrial fibrillation. Now in particular, AFib is going to show a very chaotic and messy baseline with no clear P waves. And here, if I do try to say, is there a P wave for every QRS complex? It's really hard to say. There's a lot of T waves in the way for these faster beats, so it's kind of hard to say, but I can clearly see like before the third beat, there's just kind of a squiggle there. And towards the end, there's a big like squiggle and mess that happens there that doesn't show me any real clear P waves. So no clear P waves, irregularly irregular rhythm. Most likely we're looking at AFib in this case. It's hard to assess, but this does look like we have tachycardia, especially in the middle of the image. So this is the case where we would say that this is a AFib with rapid ventricular response, which is the dangerous consideration because we cannot leave a person tachycardia, it would require management and treatment. Somebody who has AFib without rapid ventricular response, in many cases, we might not mess with that too much initially, apart from providing anticoagulation for the static blood in the atria. But as far as the rhythm goes, we would usually try to simply rate control patients here for those of you who are working on the level two and step two exam. Anything to add there, Moses? No, oh, that was very well said. It brings us and it's uh, to another uh, rhythm that is similar, but what are the arrows pointing to here? <laughs> 
Can anyone tell me what, what's odd about the P waves in this situation? Someone is saying the morphology is whack. Yes, the P waves look very different in all of these different um, in, in subsequent QRS complexes. And folks are already in the chat talking about the right answer, which is multifocal atrial tachycardia. A clinical pearl here, it's sometimes associated with pulmonary disease. So like things like COPD, that's something that uh, an attending might ask you when you're on the wards about, about MAT. Very nicely done uh, in the chat, putting some of the other associations. I also want to address something that came up when we were talking about sinus tachycardia, which is that as the rates get faster and faster, the interval between the T wave and the next P wave sometimes gets shorter. And it can sometimes look like they're getting sort of close together and smushed together. So that's something that you can see, um, not to confuse folks with uh, thinking there might be a T wave abnormality. It's the Sometimes the P, this, this next P wave uh, is, is getting close to the T wave. I want to jump in there really quick and simply say yeah. that one of the rules that we established at the beginning, which you mentioned, was that when we're looking for a long QT, the general rule of thumb is that the T wave mm -hmm. ends more than 50% on the way to the next beat, meaning that the T wave is close to the next beat. But you'll notice that we run into a really big problem for super fast heart rates like this, where the T wave inevitably has to be like right on top of the next beat because the heart's beating so fast. This is why you guys will see at some point that somebody will talk about a corrected QT interval. We actually cannot simply look at the QT interval and say, is it good or bad? You have to assess it in the context of the heart rate, how fast the heart is beating. Because the faster the heart beats, the longer we're technically allowed to have the QT interval to be relative to the next beat. So you have to adjust based on heart rate and there's a whole calculation you can do for that. But the point that we're getting at here is you might look at this and be like, aha, you told me that this was long QT. So we'll know this is tachycardia and it's just, you're gonna end up seeing that the T wave has to go somewhere. And so that rule kind of breaks down for very fast heart rates when you have a narrow complex at least. Absolutely. And this, you know, you start getting into square roots of heart rates and stuff. It's, it's too much math for me. <laughs> yeah. I've never had to actually calculate a corrected QT for any exam. So you don't have to actually do the math, even though the equation pops up from time to time. However, exactly. you do have to be aware that the heart rate does play a role in assessing QT interval. Yep. There, at least historically, there have also been different normal ranges for QTs and corrected QTs based on um, patient demographics. So that's another thing to watch out for clinically. Um, we have another example here, just the rhythm strip. Again, we're looking at the rate. And what I'm seeing here is one, two, three, four, five, right? So we're thinking um, something on the order of just over a hundred perhaps, but then there's a big long wait and then there's another one. So there's something funky going on with the rhythm, right? Let's take a look at those P waves. We have a P wave before this QRS, another P wave before the QRS, and suddenly you have a couple of P waves without any following QRS, so we know we're not in sinus right off the bat. We have another P with another QRS, and then we skip another one. Here's one trick that I use. Look at whether the PR interval is lengthening in the one right before and right after a skipped beat, right? Is there a difference? Do you, and put it in the chat, do you all see a difference in the PR interval? Right, as folks are pointing out in the chat, we're not seeing an interval. And that puts us pretty solidly in second degree AV block type two, right? Now, what's the difference between that and third degree heart block? Because this is something that gave me so much trouble, right? In third degree, there's no association whatsoever between the atria and the ventricles, right? Here, every QRS that we see has a preceding P. There's no exceptions to that. But the converse is not true, right? You have Ps with no QRSs. Whereas we would expect the incomplete heart block 
the atria are marching along at their own rate. They're not listening to anybody and the ventricles are going at their separate rate. So that's why we're dealing with second degree AV block type two, as opposed to a complete heart block picture. And, and that's exactly right. As someone's asking in the chat that PR elongation, especially on classic examples on exams, you will see that very classic lengthening in type for one. For first degree. For, uh, exactly, for type one. Uh, I'll simply add too, uh, to what I had said before about uh, third degree heart block. You'll notice that if you look at the first two QRS complexes, we can clearly see, and then the third QRS complex, there's a big difference in the interval that we have between those guys. The R to R interval has changed dramatically. Remember we said, if we have third degree heart block, the ventricles are in charge of themselves. They can do what they want. They have no reason to stumble or develop any irregularity there. So by virtue of the fact that we don't have a uniform R to R interval, it means that we 100% do not have third degree heart block. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. All right, so very fast one here we have what appears to be a very fast rate, about two big boxes between every beat. It's wide complex, it's sharp, it's tall, and yes, it's VTAC. Everybody already got that in the chat. Great job, everybody. We know what VTAC looks like now. So like, it looks kind of similar no matter where we see it. There's gonna be like minor variations in exactly how these shark teeth look when we see them. But once we see it a few times, we really start to get the picture down. Remember, wide complex means it's a ventricular beat and Tachycardia means it's fast. I have a wide complex tachycardia here, which means beat. Beautiful. And I actually- think we opened and shut that one. They nailed it. <laughs> yeah, that was too, good for, too good for us. We can't fool them. And that brings us to a strip that looks in some ways sort of similar, but there's one big difference here. And folks are already pointing it out. We sort of made a connection between VTAC and how you see that circular um, or at least very sort of stereotype recurrent pattern of electrical activity. And here we're seeing the same version in the atria. So this is atrial flutter. And I'll ask folks, what, uh, what's the ratio here? Beautiful. Four to one. Another open and shut case, Joe. Yeah, I think they're, uh, they're getting this, the hang of this. So the nice thing is, remember, most of the questions on the exam are going to be just like this, where they give you a single strip and they ask you to interpret it. They're looking for high yield pathologies here. So if we know what they look like, we should be in good shape. So here we do our normal rate and rhythm assessment. And if I look at the rate here, it looks like that's somewhere around like maybe generally speaking, somewhere around like five or six big boxes between these guys. And so I'm going to argue that I've got a fairly slow heart rate in this case, less than 50 beats per minute, most likely 300 divided by six is 50. And it's definitely slower than that. So we've got kind of like a slow heart rate. And now I'm trying to look for my rhythm and the rule of thumb that we're going to look for for rhythm here is looking for the P waves to see if we have a sinus rhythm. I'm starting to run into some trouble here because I'm seeing like a fair number of P waves that are not necessarily connected with QRS complexes. And so I'm thinking, okay, bradyarrhythmias, we got one major category for this, which is heart block. And now, as I'm looking at this, I see bradyarrhythmia insofar as it's slow. And this is not a sinus rhythm. There are some P waves. Uh, Moses, if you can go kind of point to one of these P waves, at least, that's yep. kind of like waves. in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. There's one right there that you just pointed to that isn't connected to a QRS complex. So we see that and we say, well, that's no longer sinus. So slow heart rate, brady, arrhythmia, not sinus, bradyarrhythmia. Now the question is, all right, if this is a heart block, because it looks like not all my P waves are getting propagated, what kind of heart block are we looking at here? Getting some answers coming in the chat. Looks like most people are getting this one. And yes, this is third degree heart block for two reasons. Number one, there's no consistent relationship between P waves and QRS complexes here. You can kind of fool yourself into saying, well, I think I see a P wave before the second beat. I see a P wave before the third beat see a P wave before the fifth beat, maybe not so much before the fourth one. That one's kind of sketchy there. 
but the last beat also has a P wave before. It's like most of these have P waves before them. So shouldn't this just be like P waves turning into QRS complexes, like a second degree heart block? I would normally say yes, except for the fact that for the most part, the R to R interval is fairly stable here. I don't see a couple of beats close together and then beats really far apart for the ventricles. Because the QRS complexes are mostly regular, I'm going to say this is the ventricles doing their own thing, marching along, paying no heed to the P waves. Not Mobitz 2 because we are seeing that we have a regular ventricular rate. You don't see that in second degree Mobitz. Even it looks like some of these P waves are being propagated into QRS complexes. It's a coincidence. The P wave happens to be firing before the ventricle is firing. How do we know that? Because the ventricles are just uniform in their rate of firing, which means they're not actually listening to the P waves at all then. Beautiful. Cool. Anything to add to that one? No, I think folks are also pointing out that if there is zero conduction through the AV node for the ventricle to fire, you would expect it to maybe be a little bit wider than if it was coming through the AV node. Now, obviously, you know, does it have to be that 100% of the time? No, but that is a pattern that you can see. To clarify, it doesn't have to be that way 100% of the time because the yeah, bundle of his exactly. can become our new pacemaker material. And if it does become the new pacemaker material, it is depolarizing both ventricles simultaneously. The bundle of his becomes the new kind of AV node in that case, insofar as it fires both sides of the heart at the same time. Exactly. So yes, we could see a wide complex and here we kind of are. So we can make the case that these are ventricular beats perhaps, but we don't need to see that in order to call this a third degree heart block. Beautifully said. And to somebody else's point, if it's first or second degree, every ventricular beat is still coming through the AV node. So those have to be narrow complexes. So yes, first and second degree heart block, 100% narrow complexes, third degree, who knows? It, it just depends on the individual pathology of the patient and where their new pacemaker is located. Uh, so excellent job running through those strips, guys. Um, just to kind of get to like our key learning points here before we get into some question and answer for you guys. Big picture here, if you take nothing else away from our talk is do the five steps when you look at a 12 lead EKG and do as many of them as you can when you see a rhythm strip. Rate, rhythm, axis, intervals, morphology. Burn those into our brain. Those are the guys that we're paying attention to here on every single EKG. When you see an arrhythmia, it's either fast or slow, tacky or brady. If it's a tachyarrhythmia, then we want to know, is it ventricular? Is it wide complex? Is one side of the heart firing then the other, which leads to a very big QRS complex? Or is it narrow complex, implying that we have something firing from the atria down through the AV nodes and depolarizing both sides of the heart at the same time? So wide complex and narrow complex more or less represent supraventricular versus ventricular when we're talking about those. Easy way to determine where the arrhythmia is coming from. For Brady arrhythmias, generally speaking, we're focusing on heart blocks for the step and level exams. And that means that we're looking for first degree, second degree, type one or type two, or third degree heart block. And as we've gone through in some, some of these examples, you guys are now experts at identifying whether or not we have dropped beats and whether or not we have complete dissociation of those guys like we see in third degree. Keep in mind, the EKG is a hypothesis testing tool, meaning that you read the clinical vignette and you try to answer the question as best as you can based on the patient's symptoms. And then you see if the EKG confirms your suspicions. We do this in real life too. We try to assess what the clinical pathology is in the patient. And then we use the EKG to verify that. It would be very difficult in many cases to read the EKG and then just from that alone, identify the pathology of the patient. I know that was our approach to a lot of this stuff tonight for the kind of classical path and mnemonic findings uh, may be more difficult in a clinical setting, first of all, and it might not be so easy on some of these questions that you see on the exam either. Anything to add to our key teaching points tonight, Moses? No, I think staying organized is really, really important. Um, it can be easy to get lost in the richness of data of the EKG, um, but as is true with all types of questions, um, if you just answer the first question, you get into that groove of answering, right? Just like if you don't have any idea what's going on with the EKG, not to worry, start with the rate, move to the rhythm. And you'll find that even if, the, if at first it seemed totally overwhelming, by the time you get down to intervals in morphology, you usually got a pretty good sense of what's going on. Absolutely. I'll simply throw out there for like those heart blocks in particular, 
um, courtesy of one of my students who's lurking around here and apparently spending a lot of time on Reddit when they should be studying. Here's a nice little diagram on the med school Reddit for the heart blocks with a nice little sing-along uh, rhyme associated with it. So uh, that'll be our, our last little bit on those Brady arrhythmias before we move on. So for jumping in there, Moses. Love it. Um, take it away. I think we're, we're mostly done with the uh, practice. Oh yeah, of course. All right. So uh, just to kind of give you guys an assessment of like what we do at MST. So thanks for sticking with us so far. Before we answer some of your questions, uh, our basic role at MST is to provide a source of mentor for students who are working on anything from basic uh, coursework in their first year all the way up through their fourth year in clinical exams and then beyond that into residency matching and things beyond. We also work with students before medical school, but most likely a lot of you guys are already in med school. So the main idea, our, our main thesis here and value proposition is that we provide somebody who's been through the process to help guide you through the process. Most of that is going to entail helping to dis, uh, discover what resources and what kind of study strategy and schedule you can deploy in order to earn the best score you can some of these major standardized exams, but also to develop the concepts behind how we're supposed to learn this stuff in medical school in the first place, and to talk through individual concepts on a one-by-one -one basis. Generally speaking, one-to-one -one tutoring would be somebody like Dr. Murdoch or myself meeting like this over Zoom or GoToMeeting or another platform in order to run through material on a weekly basis with you while developing a study strategy, giving you a study schedule to use as you make your way through whichever exam you happen to be working on. As I mentioned before, I've helped students from everything from basic biochemistry myself all the way up through step two CS and my colleagues like Dr. Murdoch have helped students beyond that in residency application and beyond even into the medical boards in some cases for subspecialties. Uh, in particular, we really find that our strength is adapting to your specific needs. And so for students who really could benefit from that face-to-face -face interaction of another fellow colleague walking through the material with them, we really think that we excel. And the nice thing here is that you've got a companion that can walk through everything with you. In particular, I typically follow up with the students that I work with for the rest of their medical education and continue to keep in, on top of what's going on with them beyond that. So you get to develop the relationship with somebody who's gonna be there to kind of answer your questions and listen to your concerns, worries, and fears as you make your way through medical school. Sometimes it can be hard to find somebody like that. It's difficult to kind of open up to your colleagues when you guys are all in a competitive environment. This is a no judgment zone where we can help you to learn the best that you can learn and to learn how you do learn. Uh, in addition to direct tutoring and working with students longitudinally, we do also do individual one-on-one -on -one sessions with students uh, to briefly run through a game plan for studying for step one. So if you wanna do something more short term, we can adapt to that. And of course, we kind of globalize their service to try to help students get into their best residency. So we help students develop their applications for residency programs as well. Uh, if you guys are at all interested in working with anybody like Dr. Murdoch or myself one-on-one, -on -one, please feel free to reach out. Uh, we have our website, phone number, email address listed at the bottom of this slide in particular, as well as various social media apps you can kind of reach out to us through. And we can kind of get you connected with a tutor like ourselves through one of the helpful people we have at our offices. That's us. Awesome. And I know that there's a lot of folks in the chat who are asking questions, some about EKGs, we'll get to those shortly, but also about their particular personal circumstances. Of course, um, we would love to hear from you. We answer as many questions as we can. Please reach out. Um, it's really a community of people. We've all gone through this process. Um, these are stepping stones to what ultimately matters, which is taking good care of patients. And I know that that's what we're all, what we're all really here for. Um, so at this point, uh, we have tried as best as we can to answer out loud questions that have come in, or occasionally you'll have noticed myself uh, and Joe uh, glancing to the side as we go through the chat. We apologize for those questions that were asked earlier in the webinar that we just weren't able to get to. Um, at this time, we may have a few, uh, some time for a few questions. And so um, throw those questions into the ring. Uh, as we're starting out here, as you guys send your questions our way. So any questions you guys got about EKGs or peripherally related material, please uh, send those questions to us. I uh, just want to point out, somebody criticized my grammar earlier here, or I guess syntax, and said that worser is not a word. It is indeed a word. I advise you to look at the dictionary there. I noticed that. I did not miss that in the chat. I didn't want to interrupt our conversation, though. Um, and I see a question in here that's more related to the tutoring service as opposed to EKG. So as I'm waiting for EKG questions to come in, I'll answer this. Uh, one question that somebody had asked was, how does med school tutors assess your weaknesses? 
In particular, I'll give you my context for how I work with students. I will request access to UWorld login material and MBME logins in order to see how you're doing on individual questions. And I will usually try to look for the ones that you're missing to develop a theme to those and then deploy some targeted material when we work together. And then I may also recommend that your independent study focuses on those weak areas a little bit more heavily, diving into more standardized resources that we might not have otherwise touched upon for interest of time. So in short, we take a look at what you guys are missing and we ask you directly, what do you feel weak about? Like in, in many cases, your subjective assessment is usually going to be pretty close to what the truth is when it comes to areas that you're uh, not at your best in yet. Absolutely. And what I'll add to that is information comes from so many different places, right? It comes from the question bank. It comes from doing practice exams, which stress your knowledge in a slightly different way, both in terms perhaps in timing, in terms of endurance. Um, so we really try to draw from as many sources, subjective and objective, to give you a, as good of an assessment as we possibly can. Uh, if you see this question, you can go for it. Uh, I was going to answer one. Go for it. Uh, sure. So I see somebody asking what a re-entrant mechanism is. Uh, I think the best example of this is that Wolf Parkinson white picture we talked about before. The electricity is supposed to go from the P wave or P wave, the SA node as a P wave down to the AV node and then down from the AV node into the ventricles. But if I have an accessory pathway, a bundle of kit that can take that electricity from the left ventricle and bring it back up into the atria, then that signal can then go back and hit the AV node again and then go down to the ventricles, back up to the bundle of Kent and down into the AV node again. And now I've got a circle that I formed, a circle that never ends and goes super duper fast. That is a re entrant arrhythmia that we developed as a, a form of Wolf Parkinson White. So the narrow complex tachycardia that patients will get with WPW when they're exercising or when they become emotionally distraught is going to be a form of a re entry mechanism in which we flip back around and have basically electricity going in a circle. Beautiful. There was another question about pericarditis. And so I just put up a, a one example picture of pericarditis. Remember that in a myocardial infarction, the underlying pathophysiology is plaque rupture and the formation of a thrombus occluding a vessel. And that vessel is supplying oxygen nutrients to a ventricular a myo, or a, just in general, a myocardial territory. And so you would expect, as we saw in the example with an inferior MI, that the leads will give you a clue as to which vessel is occluded and which area of the myocardium is occluded. In contrast to that, in pericarditis, you tend to have more diffuse and widespread ST elevations. You can see some of those, as well as PR depressions. Um, and you can see that uh, with the, the red arrow there. Um, again, you don't expect to see necessarily a territorial um, region, right, uh, localization, whereas in pericarditis, as you would in a myocardial infarction. And the other thing to note is going back to the vignette, right? Like if you see classical anginal symptoms or perhaps some atypical anginal symptoms that are worsened with exertion, improved with rest or medications that reduce the demand on the heart with comorbidities that are more consistent with a myocardial infarction and you see a regional territory, slam dunk. In contrast, if you see a vignette that is referencing perhaps a viral uh, prodrome, um, the demographics and the comorbidities are different and maybe even the description of the pain as being more positional in nature, that's when you start going more in the pericarditis direction. Hopefully that's helpful. Another question here about six sinus syndrome, which is one that we didn't get a chance to discuss tonight. I can try to describe this in just a couple sentences here. The idea is that we have a sinus rhythm, which means a P wave before every QRS, but the sinus rhythm is going to oscillate between slow and fast. And so every time you're gonna end up seeing six sinus syndrome on the exam, if you do, which is kind of a rare exam question, you're going to see sinus bradycardia on the EKG until suddenly sinus tachycardia or sinus tachycardia and then suddenly stopping and sinus bradycardia. So basically, sudden shifts in a sinus rhythm from fast to slow or vice versa. That's six sinus syndrome. Awesome. Couple questions here. You know, uh, heart block is one of those things that's very challenging. Let me start by um, giving you all a tip. One of the best ways to get better at something is repetition and practice. I'll tell you what I did as a, both as a 
preclinical clerkship student studying for these board exams, if there was a particular topic that I really struggled with with EKGs, I would go out and just try to look at as many examples as I could. You can do that in a couple of different ways. They'll pop up in question banks. Um, and as you go through them, if you flag questions that have heart block, you can find them that way. There are free online resources like Life in the Fast Lane. We've actually pulled a couple of EKGs from uh, this presentation from that website, high quality from the emergency uh, emergency medicine sort of FOMED literature. And then lastly, there are things like the um, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center uh, web maven that have not only EKGs, but sometimes they even have short little vignettes. So you can practice correlation of clinical uh, presentations with EKGs. So big picture, you know, uh, we may not be able to answer everyone's question, but the best way to get better is repetition and practice. As far as heart block, you know, um, the what I personally rely on the most is exactly what Joe was talking about earlier, which is one association of P before every QRS, QRS before every P, sinus, not sinus. So that's the distinction of like sinus bradycardia. We're putting that aside and then looking at um, is it regular? Are the, are the um, QRS is more regular and there's no association with P waves with the QRS or is it more of a dropped picture? And, and then the third sort of layer that I add on to that is, are the PR intervals getting longer or are they not, right? And that'll help distinguish between the two types of, of like Mobitz, right? Wenke Bach versus uh, type two. Um, is there a pattern with how many, like how many um, beeps you go through before you drop one in type one? Uh, Sometimes, but I wouldn't use that as a rule at all. That's not one of, that's not part of my algorithm for figuring out if it's, you know, type one or type two. So I would rely more on those sort of more um, physiology and uh, underlying electrophysiology mechanisms, as opposed to trying to look for, oh, it's always the drop beat is after the fourth one, because you can get into trouble that way. And it takes a lot of time to be trying to figure that out in a rhythm strip where you often don't have a representative sample of subsequent cycles. Does that make sense? Yes, it's me. So I think, I think you, uh, you nailed it there. I don't see one more question lying around here. So if you guys have any more questions, try to get them in. We are running out of time. We'll try to answer them. Um, one question here is asking about degeneration of sinus node in the elderly. Um, simply put, elderly patients are more likely to see sinoatrial node dysfunction. And so generally speaking, AFib can simply be a result of age. It does not necessarily have to be a result or maybe even multifocal atrial tachycardia. Other atrial pathologies essentially can all be manifestations simply of aging. And so therefore do not require underlying pathophys. In general though, the questions that you're gonna be seeing are gonna be asking more about what are you looking at in particular? And usually they'll give you underlying pathology or at least symptoms to give you a sense of what you're reading in the question. So in short, expect age-related changes that could lead to arrhythmias in the elderly that don't necessarily have to have an etiologic cause that's very specific. It's kind of a bland answer, but generally speaking, a 80-year-old patient could be presenting with no other new findings other than AFib or some other atrial pathology. Awesome. I think we've hit all the questions here, unless you see any others. No, I think we've I think we've covered it. Okay, in that case, I'd like to thank everybody for hanging out with us tonight, uh, as long as you have. Hopefully this was helpful, walking you through the EKG stuff. Uh, I'll give my little closing spiel and then I'll let Dr. Murdoch do his. Uh, wish everybody the best of luck as they're studying for their exams. All of these exams are very difficult. They require a lot of effort, uh, but we appreciate you guys taking your valuable time and spending some of it with us. Uh, huge compliment that you guys would take time out of your busy study schedules to pay attention and hang out with us tonight. So hopefully we were helpful. And personally, I wish you guys the best of luck on the exams that you have coming up, whether it's step one, step two, level one, level two, or a shelf exam, or maybe uh, an actual uh, board exam in medicine or something along those lines, maybe. A hundred percent. I couldn't have said it any better. Also to say that uh, it's been an extremely challenging several months to several years. It feels like at this point, um, just remember that this is one step in the process. And as someone currently in training right now, I am really excited for you all to be future colleagues, to be referring patients to you all. Um, I really want to emphasize the community nature and to say that, you know, both of us and, and MST in general are rooting for you. We're here for you. So please reach out with anything and best of luck.